Hello again. Welcome back. So we're done with session one, off to a great start. We thank God for his word. As we walk into section two, let's take a quick break to refocus our hearts in light of what we have talked about so far. This great imbalance is a massive wall standing between us and our accomplishing the Great Commission. We want to be obedient to God's call on our lives. As you're about to see, and probably already thinking, fixing this imbalance is not going to be easy. But right now, here's a few questions we'd like to consider before we move forward. Is God worth it? Does God really deserve the worship of all people? What about you? Did you do anything to deserve the access you've had to the gospel? Is there anything about you that makes you more deserving of Jesus than the three billion people who will never hear about him? With your answers to those questions in mind, we press on. Father, we come humbly before you. Having now seen this great imbalance, O oh God, would you open our eyes, open our hearts, change the way we view the world, change the way we view the purpose of our lives and churches in this world. Lord, the harvest is plentiful. Over three billion people, seven thousand people groups, Lord, who have never heard the good news of your grace in Jesus, who are born, live, and die having never encountered a church or follower of Jesus Christ. And the number is increasing, Lord. So we pray, O oh Lord, we plead that you would change this, that in these next few moments, O oh Lord, you would show us ways we are contributing to this great imbalance, O oh Lord, and that you would give us wisdom by your spirit to understand how you are calling us to change. Replace our pessimism with possibility. Replace our comfort with conviction and replace our fear with faith, O oh Lord. No matter the cost, may we be willing to spend and be spent for the sake of the nations for your glory. So we pray that you, the Lord of the harvest, would raise up among us, O oh Lord, laborers for the harvest field, that you would use our lives, use our churches, use our resources to cause your gospel to go to the nations, to go to places where the gospel has not gone, that your glory would be multiplied throughout the earth, that you would give us a holy discontentment until the blessing of your gospel is made known to every nation, every tribe, every people, every language on this earth, just as you have promised, Lord, you will bring about. That your way may be known on the earth, your saving power among all nations. Lord, may it not be said of us that we stayed in the safety of our holy huddles, the comforts of our church cocoons, but that we leveraged our lives to spread your glory among all the nations, that by your power, we worked to rectify the great imbalance and obeyed the great commission. Lord, give us wisdom, give us boldness, give us courage. Show us how to use our lives toward that end. Lord, it is in the mighty, the marvelous, the magnificent, the matchless name, the name that is above all names, the only name that is worthy of all of our praise that we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, session two of The Great Imbalance. So how did we get to this great imbalance? Like that is a really important question. You think about it, it's not like we are randomly sending resources around the world. If that was the case, then we'd send around 
40% of our resources to the unreached, but we're sending 1%. Like there's something at work here, as we're about to see many systemic factors at work in the world that are keeping us from getting the gospel to the unreached, that are keeping us from obeying the Great Commission. So let me put it this way. If, if I took a two-year-old toddler and I put two buckets in front of them, reached and unreached, and told them to put 100 blocks in either bucket, they would do a better job of dividing out the blocks than we have. Like random would be far better than what we've done. We are intentionally, maybe unknowingly, but intentionally avoiding the unreached, the people who have the least access to the gospel, which leads me to conclude there aren't just systemic factors at work in the world, there are spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms that are working nonstop to keep this great imbalance in place. Like Ephesians 6 is clear, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. 2 Corinthians 2, we must not be outwitted by Satan or ignorant of Satan's designs. And mark it down, he has designs. You think about it, Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, Jesus says this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. And Satan does not want the end to come because the end is bad news for him, really bad news. Revelation chapter seven, he will be thrown down into everlasting torment and he knows his time is short, which means he and all the demons of hell are doing everything they possibly can to keep the gospel from going to all the nations. We need to realize this. There's a reason why three billion people are unreached, because there's an adversary who wants to keep them all in the dark. And he's working nonstop to keep those in the light focused on places where there's already light. So this second session is all about saying, how did we get here? What do we need to see differently? In order that, then in the third session, we can say, what do we need to do differently? What do we need to do from here? So let's do this. In this second session, we're gonna start to ask the question, how can we, you and I, every follower of Jesus and every church, rectify this great imbalance? And here's where we need to start. First, we must change the way we view the world, specifically in three ways that we're gonna dive into. And then second, we must change the way we view our lives, specifically in nine ways that we're gonna walk through. So that's the outline for this session. And it all starts with what I'm calling here a God's eye view of the world. We need to see as best as we can the world as God sees the world. You say, well, how's that possible? Well, let's look at the world through the eyes of Jesus in the Gospels. And specifically, I put one story from the beginning of Mark's gospel that maybe more than any other captures the Christ-like, God-like sight we need. So follow along with me. I want to read this whole story. And when he, he being Jesus, returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by, carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. When they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, your son, son your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier? to say to the paralytic, your sons are, sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed, went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. I love this story. So just picture it. A crowd crammed into this home, overflowing out the door. Inside, Jesus is preaching to eager listeners, including scribes who are trying to figure out who this disease-healing, demon-delivering teacher is. And suddenly, four friends show up with a paralyzed man on a mat. They wanna get in the house, but nobody will let them in. Like, just imagine people at the door looking back, making eye contact with the man on the mat, his friends around him, and turning back around, turning back around without even budging. And when pushing and prodding won't work, 
the friends decide to get resourceful. Like, just imagine the conversation as the first guy says, well, why don't we just climb up on the roof? The second guy says, a lot of good that'll do, genius. Like, Jesus is inside, not outside. To which the first guy replies, yeah, I know that, bro. Let's just take the roof off. To which the third guy says, you can't just take a roof off. And the first guy responds, why not? They look at each other, and finally the fourth guy says, I don't think we have a better option. We've got to get our friend to Jesus. That's the only way. Let's do it. So they climb up on the roof. So a common place at a home in that day to sit or stand or lie down to sleep on a cool night, almost like we might picture a deck. It's sturdy enough to walk on. So imagine you're inside and you hear these footsteps above you as you're listening to Jesus in front of you. And all of a sudden you hear an odd noise and dirt starts to fall on your head. First it's a little, then it's a lot. And it's not just falling on you, it's falling on people all around you. Jesus himself is dodging it. The roof is coming down. You can only imagine the owner of the house screaming, what are you guys doing to my roof? We don't, we don't know for sure whose house it was. I'm pretty sure that if it was mother, Peter's mother-in-law, she was about to have another headache that she would need to be healed of. So when suddenly, as the roof starts to open up, the sun starts to peek through. And by now, Jesus, despite his authoritative teaching, has lost all the crowd's attention. More dirt falls, more tiles are removed until a massive hole is formed in the roof. Mark's description in that, in the original language here, like depicts a major demolition job. Like the text literally says, they unroofed the roof. And once this hole is made, there's a long pause as everybody waits for what happens next. And that's when a mat, so it's likely tied with ropes at its corners, is slowly lowered down and on it sits a paralyzed man, now lying in front of Jesus' feet. And no one speaks a word inside, or outside for that matter. Do you notice how Mark doesn't record a single word spoken by the friends? I can just imagine Jesus looking down at this man, then up at his friends, through the hole in the roof. Like what expression was on their faces? Were they nervous or anxious or smiling? I would assume they were sweating. So they catch their breath and they just wait to see what Jesus is gonna do. We don't know exactly what these friends look like, but we do know that whatever Jesus saw was the face of faith. And Jesus said to the man, son, your sins are forgiven. Which is pretty odd when you think about it because the man didn't even ask for that. This is where we know we don't have all the details. We don't know for sure if anyone else said anything. We do know that it was common belief in that day that physical suffering was attributable to personal sin, but we don't know if this man's paralysis was tied to specific sin in his life or if it was something he was born with. All we know is that Jesus makes a pronouncement in that moment that shocks the crowds. This man has sinned and Jesus has authority to forgive them, which leads the scribes to wonder in their hearts, the penalty for blasphemy is death, this teacher deserves death. And while the text doesn't tell us they said that out loud, Jesus saw that in their hearts, so he turns to them and says, well, what's easier, to forgive sins or to heal paralysis? And after a pause, he says, I'll show you how I have authority to forgive sins. And he turns to the paralytic man, says, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And picture it, just imagine, to the amazement of the crowd crammed into that home, to the disgust of scribes sitting there on the floor, to the delight of four friends peering down through an unroofed roof, the man stood. He stood. He immediately picked up his bed and he ran out of the room. And the crowds moved for him this time. And you can imagine those friends like running down off the roof, jumping up and down with their friend, shouting as they raced. They raced home with a demolished house in their wake, full of people who now for the first time speak in the story and say, we never saw anything like this. Is that not an awesome scene? So what does it teach us about how we need to see the world? Follow this in your notes there in your study guide. First, we must see the needs among the nations. Now, this is the constant refrain throughout Jesus' life and ministry. He saw the crowds and they were hurting. He saw their diseases and afflictions and pains and oppression and struggles and sin, which is what Mark 2 is highlighting for us. We need to see urgent spiritual needs, which are ultimate. Now, this paralytic man's ultimate need was not to stand to his feet, but to be forgiven of his sin. And our ultimate need is never physical. It's always spiritual. 
What do we all need more than anything else? Acts 2, to repent in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, which is why we have been commanded to proclaim Jesus' word in a world of spiritual need, to speak the gospel that has power to save people's lives for all of eternity. This is what Paul asked the church to pray for him in spiritual battle, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains and I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Like making disciples we talked about starts with proclaiming the gospel. Why? Because people's greatest need is reconciliation to God on this earth and in eternity. And we're prone to think, yeah, yeah, but what about people who are physically suffering? And we're about to talk about that. That's part of the story, obviously, here in Mark chapter two, but don't miss the ultimate point. We have been commanded to keep people from eternal suffering in hell. Depicted here in Luke 16 in your notes, the place of anguish and torment. Sure, we want people to be free from suffering on this earth in so many ways. And ultimately, we want people to be free from suffering forever in eternity. So if we're gonna see the world as Jesus sees the world, we must start by seeing urgent spiritual needs, which are ultimate, and we must then see urgent physical needs, which are evident. This man was lying on a mat in Mark 2, and he couldn't walk. The man in Luke 10 was beaten on the side of the road, and he needed help, and we have been commanded to display Jesus' love in a world of physical need. It's interesting, I put Romans 15 at this point in your study guide, so this is right after Paul writes about his ambition to get the gospel to unreached people in Spain, but then he says that before he goes there, he's going to Jerusalem to, to deliver an offering to the church there that was experiencing famine. So a picture of urgent physical need. And all throughout the Bible, we have been commanded to care for people amidst earthly, physical suffering. If we don't, James 2 says, we don't actually have faith. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? Faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action works, is dead. So when we look at the world in light of God's purpose for the world, we must see the needs among the nations, both spiritual needs, which are ultimate in a world of sin, and physical needs, which are evident in a world of suffering. We need to see both spiritual and physical needs among the nations as much as possible as God sees spiritual and physical needs among the nations. Then, second, we must see the barriers to reaching the nations. So spreading the gospel in a world of urgent spiritual and physical need is not easy. In the words of 1 Corinthians 16, 9, there are many adversaries, and specifically there are many barriers that make the unreached hard to reach. I always say unreached people are unreached for a reason. They're hard to reach. They're difficult to reach. In many situations, they're dangerous to reach. Like all the easy ones are taken. And I don't say that jokingly. There's a reason we're not sending more people and money to unreached places because it's a lot harder to do. You think about various barriers to reaching the unreached. There are natural barriers, think geographic barriers. Like it's hard to get to remote villages in the Amazon or deep in the rugged terrain of Afghanistan. You just follow Paul's journey after writing Romans as he traveled from Corinth to Jerusalem to Rome. You see all kinds of natural barriers, think political barriers, like we see all throughout the Bible, kings who set themselves up against God, leaders who oppose and attack the people of God, governments like we see in Revelation that work against the spread of the gospel. Think conflicts and wars and corruption. All these things obviously affect our ability to make disciples and multiply churches among the nations. Then think developmental barriers like economics, economic instability and availability of education or access to clean water or medicine. Like all these factors affect reaching the nations with the gospel. Then think social barriers, slavery, trafficking, violence, crime, ethnic tension, religious persecution, urbanization. All these present unique barriers to making disciples and multiplying churches. And then we haven't even gotten to linguistic barriers. There are over 7,000 languages spoken around the world today, and approximately half of them still have little or no scripture. Like, obviously, that barrier has to be overcome at some point if we're gonna make disciples and multiply churches. That hinges on people having God's word. And amidst all of those barriers, you have almost constant persecution in unreached places. These are not places in the world that welcome missionaries. These are places in the world that reject missionaries and kill Christians for even speaking about Jesus. 
In many places, it's not the government that will kill you. Your family will do that far before the government would get involved. So you put all that together, no wonder they're unreached. And Jesus prepared us for this. Matthew chapter 24, the church modeled this for us, starting with Stephen in Acts chapter seven, his martyrdom. The Bible actually promises us this. 2 Timothy chapter three, verse 12, indeed all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So God, open our eyes. The adversaries and the barriers are many to making disciples and multiplying churches among all the nations. But that's what I love about this story in Mark chapter two, because barriers didn't stop these four friends from bringing a man in need to Jesus. And those barriers cannot stop the people of God today who are serious about the Great Commission. But that's just it. If we're gonna be serious about the Great Commission, then we must wisely consider what it will take to meet needs, ultimate spiritual needs and evidence physical needs, and to overcome barriers. I love Acts 20, 22 through 24. Paul says, I'm, a, I'm going, I'm driven by the Spirit. I know it's gonna be hard and imprisonment and afflictions await me, but I don't count my life of any value nor as precious to myself if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel, the grace of God. Give us, God, God give us that kind of faith in the church today. God, help us to wisely consider what it will take to meet needs and overcome barriers with faith that is confident. Like, think these four friends in Mark chapter two. They knew Jesus could help their friend. They believed if they could just get their friend in front of Jesus, something amazing would happen. Like, do we believe that? That if we can just get the gospel to these places and people groups, something amazing will happen. God, give us confident faith, compassionate faith. These friends loved this man. And you don't go to measures like they did in Mark 2 for somebody you don't care for. Imagine that man lying on that mat while all these crowds of people were running to this home where Jesus was teaching. I praise God for four faithful friends who saw that man in need and did something about it. So God raised up a compassionate church that sees unreached people in need and does something about it with faith that's creative. Like these guys in Mark 2 were scrappy, resourceful, even a bit reckless. No barrier standing in their way. No crowd, no roof. They demolished a house to get their friend to Jesus. God, give us creative, resourceful, scrappy, even reckless faith. And think about this, their faith was contagious. And Mark tells us very little about this man lying on the mat. But when I try to imagine myself like lying on that mat, I'm lying there, word gets around that Jesus is teaching in the house up the way. Everybody starts running, I'm stuck. Until four friends say, we're gonna take you to Jesus, because he could help you. And I think their faith starts to encourage my own. And maybe Jesus can help me, maybe he will. When I'm lying on that mat outside the house, the crowds are looking at me but won't let me in, I think I'd start to get discouraged. Then I'd look over at my friends, talking, pointing up at the roof, hatching a plan, and they come back, tell me their crazy idea. I think my faith would be encouraged. When I'm lying there on the roof, watching them dig a hole in it, strap ropes to my mat, lower me down. I'm guessing I'm looking up in their eyes, seeing their determination, and their faith is bolstering my own with hopeful anticipation until the moment when my mat settles on that floor and I look up in the face of Jesus with the expectant faces of my friends in the background, I think my heart would be filled with faith in that moment. Their faith was contagious. Their faith affected this man in need affected Jesus and meeting that man's need. God, give us contagious faith that believes Jesus is what he is, who the nations need. All people and all nations, they need him. It may it be evident to the peoples of the world that the church believes he's good and great and glorious and can meet their deepest needs. Like God, give us faith like 1 Corinthians 9 that says we'll do whatever it takes to bring the nations to Jesus. I want that kind of faith in my life. I want to fuel that kind of faith in my family and in the church that sees needs among the nations, that sees barriers to reaching the nations and says, we're going to meet the needs. We're going to overcome the barriers with faith that Jesus is able to do something amazing when we do. When we bring people from the nations to Jesus, he will show his goodness and his grace and his power and his glory and his love in ways that will astound and change people's lives. So tonight, like right now, I wanna introduce you to a tool that Radical has been working for the last couple of years 
on developing to help fuel this kind of site. Like seeing the needs, seeing the barriers, in order to fuel this kind of faith that says, let's meet these needs, let's overcome these barriers, and let's make the grace and glory of our God known among the nations. So I want to introduce you to what we're calling Stratus. It stands for Strategy for Unreached Synergy. And it's a tool for the church to see the needs among the nations and see the barriers to reaching the nations in order that we might give ourselves wisely to the Great Commission. And kind of at the center of this tool is something called the Stratus Index. So watch this video with me and then I'll explain it a little bit more. Today, over three billion people in the world have zero access to the gospel of Jesus. The reason for this is complicated, very complicated. And each people group has a unique set of reasons they haven't heard the gospel. However, there are hundreds of organizations, ministries, governments, NGOs, all working to impact humanitarian issues around the world. Some of these organizations sit on top of incredibly detailed data about these issues. We created the Stratus Index to bring all of that data together for the sake of reaching people who need to hear the gospel. The Stratus Index utilizes trusted data from over 35 sources. Sources like the Joshua Project, the World Health Organization, UNICEF, the World Bank, and even the CIA. We've taken key factors like natural barriers in Nepal that keep missionaries from just physically getting to people, or political issues in China that keep the gospel from spreading on a national level. Developmental issues like the lack of clean water in Somalia, social issues like women's rights in Iraq, or child trafficking in India. All of this data comes together and we pair that information with people's access to the gospel. The tool crunches the numbers and every single country is given a Stratus Index score. For example, right now, if all factors are taken into account, Afghanistan ranks number one on the Stratus Index, meaning the data tells us that the Afghan people not only have the most urgent spiritual needs with little to no access to the gospel, but they also have the most urgent physical needs. It's all about bringing a new perspective to the ways we go about doing missions. The Stratus tool is simple to use, and we suggest you just dig in and get to work. Accomplishing the Great Commission will not be easy, but we've been commanded by God to take the gospel to all people groups. It's our prayer that the Stratus tool will help you, your family, and your church as you endeavor to be obedient. As far as I know, as far as we can tell, this tool offers a glimpse of the world that's not been seen up to this point. So I wanna, I wanna give you a brief kind of overview now, then once Secret Church is over, you'll be able to dive into this tool online for free, all you want. We just want it to be available to the church. It'll, Lord willing, in the days to come, be available in multiple languages so we can serve the church and in in across the world as we focus on getting the gospel to the nations. So the only reason it's not uh, yeah, up now where you could look at it is because I don't want you to plan on it while we're walking through the word. So as you've heard, we've taken hundreds of data points on the nations from all kinds of different sources like World Bank, WHO, the UN, Fragile States Index, Freedom House, all kinds of sources to give a physical picture of the nations. And then we've combined that data together with spiritual data about the progress of the gospel among different nations in order to help us see the world more like God sees the world in terms of urgent spiritual need and urgent physical need in such a way that any follower of Jesus can see where these needs collide most. And we've created the Stratus Index that ranks the 200 or so countries in the world in terms of urgent spiritual and physical need. So basically, where are the most urgent needs with barriers to reaching those places? Like developmental barriers, natural barriers, political barriers, social barriers, all the barriers we just saw and talked about from the Word, when you put them all together, where are the hardest to reach places in the world? And the more red they are on this map, the more unreached and hard to reach they are. The more green they are on this map, the more reached and in a sense, easier to reach they are. Not that there's any person even in the world that's easy to reach, but putting it together relatively. And you'll see a list of countries on the Stratus Index. As you heard, the top of that list is Afghanistan, then Somalia, 
then Yemen, Maldives, Sudan, Pakistan, Iraq, Syria, Mauritania, Mali, and you can click on any one of these countries and find out information about the spiritual and physical needs in that place. You can click on a video that will lead you to pray for that country. You can see all the people groups in that country. And the darker the red, the more unreached they are. And you can see all the different data points with different barriers that must be overcome if we as the church are gonna make disciples and multiply churches in these places. And you can do this for any country in the world. And, and you can also look through, look at the world through the lens of specific factors. So you can toggle data points on and off to find places in the world where maybe there's the least clean water and least access to the gospel. And the whole map will change to show places that are have the least clean water and least, least access to the gospel, or the least freedom and least access to the gospel, or hundreds of other factors you can explore. And in the end, you'll see how we are spending tons of resources and sending many missionaries to more reached places, green and yellow places ranked up there in the hundreds. And it's not, again, that we need to ignore those places or stop doing ministry in those places. We want to encourage the church in those places for sure, but we desperately need to change at some point where we're sending money and missionaries. We need to get to the red. We need to rectify this great imbalance, and Stratus is designed to open our eyes to it, to help us see the man on the mat, to see the nations who are in need, so we might rise up with confident, compassionate, creative, contagious, faith and say, what's it going to take to meet those needs and overcome those barriers and make disciples and multiply churches in all these red places that they might enjoy and exalt God in all of his glory? Because that's what we're living for, right? Every Christian, every church, we have this purpose, enjoy and exalt God in all of his glory among all the nations, not just some, all of them. So God, help us to see the world as he sees the world. That's a huge step. And then and then to see our lives as God sees our lives. If we're gonna rectify the great imbalance and accomplish the Great Commission, we need a God's eye view of the world, and then we need a God-centered perspective of our lives. I put Luke 15 in your study guide at this point, because we have a God who leaves the 99 to go to the one with supernatural love. He pursues the one who's lost. He does what it takes to find them. We need to see our lives as a picture of that kind of love in a world of urgent need, reflecting him, which means we need to change the way we view our lives. I mentioned earlier specifically in nine ways. So let's run through them. We're gonna run fast, but hang with me because every one of these is important. One, we must replace a limited local focus with an expansive global vision in our lives and in our churches. Whenever I, we, anybody, talks about global mission in the church, people inevitably say, what about the needs right around us here? Why are we talking about the needs among the nations when there's so much need in our nation right here? Shouldn't we just focus here? And the answer is not if you believe the Bible. Hopefully we've seen this from cover to cover in the Bible already, Genesis 12, Revelation 7, everywhere in between. But here's the other part of the story we haven't looked at yet. It's also evident from cover to cover in the Bible. The global purpose of God has always been and faced, been resisted, faced resistance from the comfortable people of God. From the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, when they refused to scatter for the spread of God's glory, they tried to stay in one place for the sake of their own name. God says in Genesis 12, no, I want my blessing to spread to the ends of the earth. Then in Isaiah 56, God sets up the court of the Gentiles as a place for the nations to come and pray and behold his glory. But by Mark chapter 11, the people of God had set up shop in that same court. They were basically saying, we're gonna make a profit for ourselves, let the nations go to hell. In Acts chapter 11, Peter receives criticism for sharing the gospel with the Gentiles, the nations. Acts 15, God's people are trying to establish laws for the Gentiles to follow in order to receive the gospel of God's grace. I could go on and on with story after story in scripture, but maybe the clearest example is one of God's prophets in the Old Testament who totally missed the heart of God. So contrast Jonah with Jesus with me. Think about Jonah. When God called him to go to the Ninevites, who were enemies of the Israelites, and proclaim a message of repentance there, what do we see in Jonah? Well, clearly he wanted his way more than he wanted God's will. He did exactly the opposite of what God told him to do. Why? Because he desired the good of his nation more than he desired the gospel and other nations. Can I say that again? He desired the good of his nation more than he desired the gospel in other nations. Is that possible among God's people? Is that possible in our hearts? Absolutely. 
It is. Keep going. He failed to connect the mercy of God in his life with the mission of God in the world. He claimed, even celebrated salvation, yet he wanted to keep it to himself. He disconnected the mercy of God in his life from the mission of God in the world. Keep going. He knew the character of God in his head, but he neglected the compassion of God in his heart. Is that possible? To know the truth of the gospel in our heads and to miss the love of God in our hearts? Ultimately, he was more concerned about his own empty desires than he was about others' eternal destinies. He was so sad, disappointed, he didn't have a plant to shield him from the sun one day. And he didn't care a rip about hundreds of thousands of people in need of God's grace for eternity. So contrast Jonah with Jesus, as the Gospels do. Instead of reluctantly preaching to sinners in need of God's grace in other nations, Jesus relentlessly pursues sinners in need of God's grace in all nations. He seeks the lost with his life, even to the point of death. Instead of merely going to a city filled with his enemies, Jesus gives his life on a cross for the sake of his enemies. Instead of helping people in Nineveh temporarily avoid the just wrath of God, Jesus brings people in all nations eternally into the joyful worship of God. Jesus loves, pursues, lives, dies for the sake of the nations. So contrast Jonah with Jesus and then ask the question, which will characterize you and me? The spirit of Jonah that prioritizes care only for our people, that says, whether out loud or through our actions, we care about people right around us in our country, who are more like us? Or will we be characterized by the Spirit of Jesus who passionately cares for all peoples? Will we be marked by the Spirit of Jonah that is content to let other nations go to hell as long as we can keep our nation and be comfortable in it? Or will we be marked by the Spirit of Jesus who is committed to leading people from every nation to heaven? This is the heart of Jesus who by his blood gave his life for the sake of people from every tribe and language and people and nation. If we live in a church culture today, many of us live in a country today where we prioritize ourselves and our greatest concern is the preservation of our nation. And I'm not saying I'm not thankful for my nation and God's grace in it in so many ways, but my nation will not last forever. And the purpose of my life is not ultimately to preserve it. The purpose of my life and your life, our lives, is to enjoy and exalt all the glory of God in all the nations. If we're gonna rectify the great imbalance and obey the Great Commission, we must replace a limited local focus with an expansive global vision. That's number one. Number two, we must replace an either or approach with a both and approach to urgent spiritual and physical need. And here's why this is so important as we see needs in the world. So there are some who would say, we just need to look at spiritual needs. Or where do people need the gospel? We need to focus on getting the gospel to them. But if those people in need of the gospel are starving, they don't have clean water, or they're being trafficked, and they're in the middle of war, then surely we need to consider those physical needs at some point and how we can show the love of Jesus to them. But on the other side of the spectrum, there are Christians who would say, we need to focus on physical needs regardless of the gospel. We're gonna give our, our attention to those physical needs without ever proclaiming the gospel. But neither of these approaches squares with the ministry of Jesus or the church in the New Testament. Like your study guide says, Acts 11, 19 through 30 at this point, but unfortunately the only verses listed there go through verse 26. And these verses focus on the spread of the gospel, the founding of the church at Antioch, so spiritual need, but then verses 27 through 30 focus on care for physical needs in the church of Jerusalem. So both and. We've already talked about both the spiritual and the physical needs that Paul was focused on in Romans chapter 15. Luke 4, clearly Jesus is talking about the gospel with implications for the poor, the prisoner, the blind, and the oppressed. When you read the Bible, then you come away not with an either or approach, but a both and approach that realizes we must be ultimately, but not exclusively, focused on urgent spiritual need. We've already seen this. People's spiritual needs are ultimate. To use the picture of John 6 in your notes there, people's ultimate need is not for physical bread on earth, but the spiritual bread of life that is found through faith in Jesus. To use a Similar contemporary example, a water filter can help provide someone clean water, which is good and needed. But that water filter can't get anyone to heaven. Only the gospel can do that. Which is why we must be ultimately, but not exclusively focused on urgent spiritual need, while we must be intentionally, but not exclusively, responsive to urgent physical need. So we don't ignore urgent physical need. We're compassionate in the face of such need, just as Jesus was throughout his ministry, like we see there in Mark 5. We must be intentionally responsive to people's physical needs as we reach people with the gospel, like we see in Acts 3. 
and as we care for people through the church. So this is a mark of the church that we give sacrificially to meet each other's needs. So what does this mean for us? As we think about needs in the world then, it means we rightly give attention to urgent physical needs in places with less urgent spiritual needs. In other words, reach places. Just because a place is reached doesn't mean we ignore it. The picture we see over and over again in the New Testament is an offering for the church at Jerusalem in the middle of famine. And all the churches were pulling together resources to help them. That's a good and right and biblical thing to do, to give attention to urgent physical needs among our brothers and sisters in Christ. At the same time, we also rightly give attention to urgent spiritual needs. In other words, unreached places, in places with less urgent physical needs. So just because Emiratis are extremely wealthy and physically well off, doesn't mean we ignore their need for the gospel as an unreached people group. We rightly give attention to getting the gospel to them, even though their physical needs are not as great. The point in the end is, ultimately, correcting the great imbalance will require intentional focus on both urgent spiritual and physical need. And I would add, especially places where both of these needs collide, like those high stratus index countries. This is where I think about the feeding of the 5,000 in Matthew chapter 14. What another awesome story. Just the picture of Jesus and his disciples in that story, what it teaches us about the opportunity to have and be the hands of, and feet of Jesus in a world of urgent need. Like, let's reflect the compassion of Jesus for those in need. Let's rely on the resources of Jesus. I love that statement. And the disciples, they say to Jesus, this is a desolate place, and we don't have anything to feed all these people. That's like standing in front of Niagara Falls and saying, you can't find anything to drink. So Jesus looks at them and says, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. And the emphasis in the language there is on you. And they respond, well, we have five loaves and a bread and two fish. And don't miss the point. Jesus was calling these disciples to do something that they could not do in their own power, with their own resources. He was teaching them to recognize their own insufficiency and at the same time to realize his complete sufficiency. In two ways. One, he meets needs in us, evident in Jesus' proclamation later that he's the bread of life. He's the one who has what our souls need to be satisfied. We've seen that. He meets needs in us and follow this. He meets needs through us. Think about it. If the point of the story was only to show Jesus' ability to meet needs for people, he could have called down bread from heaven. The people would have seen maybe in an even greater way who he was, but instead he prays and asks for the Father's blessing and then he calls his disciples to his side. Jesus doesn't give out one piece of bread in the story. Instead, he gives the bread to the disciples and they distribute it. And we're not told exactly how this miracle took place. Our imagination is kind of free to wonder about how five loaves suddenly or maybe slowly began to multiply from his hands into their hands. But that's the picture, the hands of Christ serving the hands of his disciples and the hands of the disciples serving the multitudes in need. That's the picture. Jesus uses his disciples to meet needs in others. So think about this in light of the needs we're talking about in the world right now. You might be tempted to think right where you're sitting, like, what can I do about this? I have so little. But don't think that way. You're standing at Niagara Falls. Don't you see there's plenty of water? You know Jesus, and he wants to use your life with all the resources he's given you to meet others' needs, to meet needs among the nations. So as we look at these needs, spiritual and physical in the world, let's rely on the resources of Jesus to meet those needs. Let's receive the blessing of Jesus as we meet those needs. Can you imagine the blessing of even being involved in this miracle? Like you see five loaves and two fish, and you start passing out food and loaf after loaf and fish after fish appears for thousands of people. Where's it coming from? Just imagine the joy and elation associated with that scene. And then, like, can it be a coincidence that they pick up leftovers and there are 12 basketfuls left? 12 baskets of bread in the hands of 12 disciples? How awesome is this? How exhilarating is it together to be the hands and feet of Jesus, seeing his power at work through you in a world of urgent need? This is what God desires to do with you and me and our lives and our families and our churches. And it all starts with either, with replacing an either or approach with a both and approach to urgent spiritual and physical need in the world. So that's second, third way we must change our perspective on our lives. We must replace a focus on reach mission fields with a focus on reach mission forces. We must replace a focus on reached mission fields 
with a focus on reached mission forces. And here's what I mean by that. From the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, Matthew chapter four, verse 19, we've talked about this. Every follower of Jesus is called, designed, commissioned to be a fisher of men. So when we reach people with the gospel, they become what? They become fishers of men. They go from being a mission field to being a mission force. This is simple, basic Christianity from the very beginning of the New Testament. Now, let's apply that to the green and yellow parts of the maps that we've looked at. Places that were once mission fields are not mission fields in the same way anymore. Yes, there's more people in every place in the world that still need the gospel, but in those reached places, it's time for those mission fields to become a mission force. God designs mission fields that have been reached to become mission forces that are engaging the unreached. Think about Antioch. People in Antioch were first reached with the gospel in Acts chapter 11. Then two chapters later, they're sending out missionaries to unreached places. That's the way God has designed the church to work. The problem is we keep going back to mission fields. I think about U.S. Christians going to work in Latin America where the gospel has gone in most of Latin America, where disciples have been made and churches have been multiplied. It's time for us to see Latin America not as a mission field for us to send missionaries to, but a mission force that is sending missionaries around the world. This is the task of missions. It's what we see Paul and Barnabas going out from Antioch to do. It starts with entering into a place, establishing a presence among unreached people, men and women missionaries sent out by the Holy Spirit of God to establish a presence, to live and work among unreached people, where they do evangelism, proclaiming the gospel to unreached people. They do discipleship, teaching people to obey Jesus, and they're focused on healthy church formation, planning a biblical church and biblical churches among the unreached. They do leadership development, training pastors for those churches, missionaries to go out from those churches so that those churches can be led, led by those pastors. New missionaries can be sent out from them. The original missionaries who came to that people group can then exit, moving on together now with new believers and new missionaries and new churches alongside them to reach more unreached people. That's what's happening in the Bible. It's what Paul's doing in Romans 15. He's exiting now with a host of Christians in his wake, moving on together for the spread of the gospel to new places. In God's design, the missions field becomes a missions force. And when we realize this, we start to realize that many of the greatest laborers for the harvest field are currently in the harvest field. Let me give you an example. Turn of the 20th century, Korean Peninsula was less than 1% Christian, less than 1%. Missionaries went there, the gospel began to spread in such a way that 100 years later, at the turn of the 21st century, there were 10 million Christians in South Korea alone. And South Korea was second among countries in the world behind only the United States in sending missionaries, which is pretty remarkable when you realize South Korea is only the size of Florida and California combined. And what that means is some of the greatest laborers for the harvest field today were in the har harvest field just a generation or two ago. What if the greatest mission fields of today are designed by God to be the greatest missions forces of tomorrow? Like church, let's believe, let's believe this. Let's believe that God by his grace and his power can take a country like Afghanistan, less than 1% Christian, and through us sending missionaries and resources with the gospel there, that 100 years from now, there might be 10 million followers of Jesus in Afghanistan sending out missionaries around the world. So is that possible? That's exactly what God did on the Korean Peninsula. And he can do it again if we believe he can do it again and we give ourselves to it. So instead of merely going to reach mission fields while we ignore the unreached, which is what we as the church are doing right now, we must go with reach mission forces to engage the unreached. That is a massive paradigm shift that must take place. We must stop going to reach mission fields while ignoring the unreached. Instead, we must go with reach mission forces to engage the unreached. We must partner together in the gospel. Think Philippians chapter one, that the nations might enjoy and exalt God in all of his glory. All right, fourth way, we must change our perspective. We must replace a flawed ROI, return on investment, with a fixed resolve to complete the commission Jesus has given to us. So I'm gonna use an illustration here from one of uh, our brothers who I work alongside in uh, Radical, who has spent the last 25 years of his life in the hardest reached, hardest reached places in the world, high up in remote mountain villages. And he sat across the table one day with a donor who wanted to fund some water projects at a substantial amount. And this brother shared with this donor the need for clean water up in these villages that he was going into, along with the gospel, because no people haven't heard the gospel up in these villages. Most of them have never heard the name of Jesus, never even heard his name. The donor said, well, I can get this many wells dug, dug in. And he mentioned, I won't mention the specific country, but a country that is green on the map. 
I can get this many wells dug in this country for this amount of money with the support of churches there. Just to give you a picture of how green this country is, it's 83% professing Christian. It's one of the most Christian countries in the world. The donor said to my friend that I work alongside, he said, hey, can you match that return on investment? And my friend began to explain to this donor that these mountain villages are a bit different from that particular country, that there are actually mountains there and there aren't roads to go up into them. It's a lot harder to get to these villages, to get clean water there. And there would actually be resistance at every turn because these villages are very opposed to the gospel. And the donor walked away and said, I want to be able to see more wells for the money I give. And that picture is a microcosm of one of the main problems that has led to 99% of our money going to reached places in the world, a flawed ROI, a flawed return on investment. We in the church have focused our giving on places where we can see the most returns in the fastest amount of time, the most impressive numbers to report to givers and donors, the best stories to share in our churches. And if we want thousands of people being saved in an open-air evangelistic event, in South America or Africa or thousands of churches being planted at amazing speeds, then we're gonna keep focusing on those reached places. Remember, that's the problem. We have thought the Great Commission was make a lot of disciples, as many as possible, when the Great Commission is a specific command to make disciples among all the peoples, all the nations of the earth. And if we don't realize this and change our perspective, then we'll keep celebrating numbers of disciples and churches in reached places while we keep ignoring what Jesus has commanded us to do among three billion people who haven't even heard his name. Because here's the deal, you're not holding an open air evangelistic event in Afghanistan or Somalia or Yemen. And you're likely not gonna see thousands of churches being planted at amazing speeds with all kinds of physical needs being met in a political, developmental, social structure that's supportive of the church. So I guess that's the question in light of the constant theme in the book of Acts of following the Holy Spirit's leadership to press on to more and more places, no matter what it costs, are we willing to go to the hardest places with the Holy Spirit in our day? Are we willing, are we willing to meet the toughest needs in the world around us in our day? needs in Yemen, needs in North Korea? Are we willing to engage the smallest peoples, the smallest, most remote people groups in the Amazon, Amazon jungle or the Himalayan mountains or the North African desert? And are we willing to endure the longest challenges? The question we must answer is, do we as the church have the stomach to keep pressing on and stay focused on reaching unreached people in places when the stories and the numbers don't come pouring in like we'd like them to? Brothers and sisters, we must replace a flawed ROI with a fixed resolve to complete the commission that Jesus has given to us. Number five then, related to that, we must replace the desire for quick success stories with devotion to slow, sustainable strategies. And making disciples, multiplying churches in the red, hardest to reach places, will not happen overnight. And I should add that even in those places, we will be tempted to short circuit the Great Commission, to do evangelism, but not do discipleship to say we're making disciples. We got movements making disciples, but without gathering those disciples together into churches or we're training pastors for those churches that will lead them to health. We must remember that more and fast, though, is not always better than less and slow. Like I look at Paul in 1 Corinthians 3 and 4 describing his work in planning churches as being like a spiritual parent for the church. And any mom or dad knows, parenting takes time. It's often slow, it's tedious, it's frustrating, it's hard. With all due respect to my kids who I love, but we need to remember, we must be faithful to the task before us regardless of size and speed. Paul's words at the very beginning of 1 Corinthians 4 are so important. Success in this task is not about having the best numbers to report or best stories to share. Success in this task is about being found faithful to do what God has called us to do when things are going fast and when things are going slow. Absolutely. Do we desire for the gospel to spread fast? Second Thessalonians chapter three. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may be speed ahead and be honored at the same time. So I put Acts one early in your study guide on this one because that chapter tells us that after Jesus' entire ministry on earth, he only had 120 people who had actually stuck around and done what he told them to do. 120, 33 years, 12 disciples, one of whom fell away and a little over 100 others. That seems pretty small but there was something God was doing and the less and slow that in his wisdom would resound to his glory around the world. Just think about it. What if every one of us as a disciple, every one of our churches, what if we just multiplied once over the next 10 years? 
We'd say, well, that's not moving very fast. Surely we can do better than that. But just think about that. You just do the math. If you start with only, let's take the smallest, most conservative estimate, 500 million evangelical Christians in the world. So research would show there's a lot more than that. Well, let's just start there. If every disciple in church multiplied one time every 10 years, you would literally reach the entire world, all the nations in the next 40 years. I would say reaching the entire world with the gospel in the span of a generation sounds pretty glorious to me. This is what I love about John Patton, a missionary who went to the New Hebrides, a cannibalistic people group. I'll tell you more about him in a minute. But he said, he said, plant down your forces in the heart of one tribe or race. Work solidly from the center, building up with patient teaching and lifelong care, a church that will endure. Rest not till every people and language and nation has such a Christ center throbbing in its midst with the pulses of this new life at full play. Rush not from land to land, from people to people in a breathless, fruitless mission. The concentrated common sense that builds for eternity will receive the fullest approval of God in time. Oh, that's so key. In our contemporary church world, at least in the West, where we want to say we're going to reach this many people by this date to stop and replace our desire for quick success stories with devotion to slow, sustainable strategies. And devotion is the right word. So that leads to number six. We must replace our fear of the world with faith in God's word. For far too long, we have let fear in so many ways, fear of the unknown, fear of the foreign and unfamiliar, fear of harm, fear of Muslims, Fear of being alone, fear of failing, fear of not having enough money when we retire, fear of not being able to do this or that. Fear in this world keeps us from making disciples of all nations with faith in God's word. And there's a sense in which this fear is not all our fault, meaning part of the reason we fear is because we haven't been taught well about places and people around the world and all that's involved in reaching them. The point is, though, we're not the first among God's people to be afraid like this. I put Numbers 13 and 14 throughout your study guide at this point, just to go back and look at. We don't have time to dive in deep here now, but here's the anatomy of fear, evident in God's people when he told them, run into the promised land, and instead they retreated. So how does fear like that happen? Well, it starts when you disregard the goodness of God. God's people totally forgot how he had brought them out of slavery in Egypt to get to that point, how he had promised them abundance if only they would trust his goodness you disregard the goodness of God. You doubt the greatness of God. They doubted God's ability to overcome the barriers before them. Here's how that happens. You magnify potential problems and you minimize powerful promises. They said, these people are like giants. We can't do this. All the while forgetting that all the way back in Genesis chapter 13, 15, God had promised to give them this land generations before. But you disregard the goodness of God, doubt the greatness of God, you inevitably disobey, disobey the word of God. They turn back from the promised land, and ultimately, you disqualify yourself from the blessing of God. They missed out. They completely missed out on God's good purpose for their lives. Brothers and sisters, may this not be us in our day. Let's put aside all fear of this world and put our faith in God's word. Here's the anatomy of faith, evident in Caleb and Joshua in that story. You believe the goodness of God. You believe he's good and you trust he's great. You trust the greatness of God. Here's the key. Where others see an obstacle, you see an opportunity. Caleb knew the peoples of the promised land were no match for God's people with God's power. God, help us to see like this. When we see barriers in the world, God, help us to see opportunities for the display of your power and your grace. That's faith. While others worry about man's power, you're confident in God's presence. You believe the goodness of God, you trust the greatness of God, so you obey the word of God. You can't sit still, you can't retreat, not with the commission God has given to you. You're not content with ignorance of need. People of faith can't just stick their head in the sand and pretend like everything's perfect. You're not even content with knowing about need. You don't look at information on the stratus page and think, well, that's helpful information. No, you are only content when you're doing what God has said to do in order to meet need. You're showing your faith by your works, James 2 says. And when you do that, when you walk forward in faith like that, you experience the blessing of God. Don't you want this? Don't you want to spend your life on the purpose for which the good, great, glorious God of the universe has called you with his spirit inside you, his spirit who's a river of living water welling up to eternal life. Let's do this, church. Let's replace fear of this world with faith in God's word. Number seven, or three more. Stay with me. Number seven, 
We must replace casual Christianity with passionate love for Christ. Casual, nominal, cultural Christianity will not get this job done. I know there are many people thinking, wait, wait, so this secret church is for missionaries or pastors or I don't know who, but not me. That's because we have so diluted Christianity and the mission of Jesus Christ that we don't all see this as the purpose of our lives. But this is, I hope we've seen it in God's word, this is what it means to be a Christian. To be a Christian is to live with radical abandonment for the glory of Jesus among the nations. That's what it means for all of us to follow Jesus. Look at the Bible. Those initial disciples of Matthew 4 left everything to follow Jesus. The word repent there is to renounce your former way of living. Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he can't be my disciple. Whoever doesn't bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. All the way down to the end, if any, any one of you does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. You think about what that meant for those original disciples. Right, we'll talk about in just a second what this means for our lives, but for them, the call to follow Jesus initially was a call to leave behind comfort. Like these guys were leaving behind everything that was familiar to them, all that was natural for them, leaving comfort for uncertainty. Jesus didn't say they were, where, even where they would go, they were going. He just said who they'd be with. Like that'll preach. Followers of Jesus don't always know all the details about where they're going, but they do know who they're with. We believe we leave behind our comforts, our careers. This was an abandonment of profession for these guys, at least temporarily. Now again, we're gonna come back to how this applies to all of us. Just see how it applied to them. Feel it from their shoes. Leaving behind comfort and careers, they're completely reorienting their life's work as a disciple of Jesus. Possessions, they drop their nets. Now these guys were not among the economically elite in society, but the fact that they had this living and a boat, successful trade as fishermen, shows these men had much to lose in following Jesus. We find out later they likely still had a boat and various other things, but the reality is at this moment, they followed Jesus with nothing in their hands. Possessions, position, this is big. It's one of the things that set Jesus' disciples apart from other disciples who would follow rabbis in that day. Disciples would attach themselves to a rabbi to promote themselves. It was a step up the ladder toward greater status and position. But that wasn't the case with Jesus' disciples. This wasn't a step up the ladder. This was a step down. They would eventually find out when they followed the rabbi, the teacher, the one who was tried and killed. They leave behind our families, James and John, leave their father, they're not the only ones who are told to do this. Remember Luke chapter nine, verse 60, 61 through 62. Don't even go back and say goodbye to your family. Jesus tells a potential disciple there. Our families, friends, safety. This is a rabbi, a teacher, who will soon say to these same men, I send you out like sheep among wolves. All men will hate you because of me. If they persecute me, they will persecute you also. They were abandoning their safety. Obviously, following Jesus means abandoning our sin, and follow Jesus, following Jesus means abandoning ourselves. This is the message that we know would become central for any and every prospective follower of Jesus. If anyone is going to follow me, he must deny himself. That's where following Jesus starts. In a world where everything revolves around self, protect yourself, promote yourself, preserve yourself, take care of yourself, advance yourself, Jesus says, crucify yourselves. So don't buy it. So many Christians have bought it. Professing Christians have bought the idea that all you need to do is make a decision, pray a prayer, sign a card, become a Christian, keep your life as you know it. It's not true. You become a follower of Jesus, you lose your life as you know it. You gain a whole new life. Now, I want to be really careful here. I'm not saying I can't, wouldn't say, based on the whole of the New Testament, that every follower of Jesus must lose their career, sell or give away all their possessions, leave their family behind, physically die for the gospel. But the New Testament is absolutely clear on this. For all who follow Jesus, comfort and certainty in this world are no longer our concerns. Our careers revolve around whatever Jesus calls us to do, however he wants to use us and each of our careers to spread the good news of his kingdom. Your possessions are not your own. My possessions are not my own. We no longer live for material pleasure in this world. We forsake material pleasure in this world in order to live for eternal treasure in the world to come. And that could mean any one of us selling or giving away everything we have. Position is no longer our priority. When it comes to family, absolutely. Based on the whole of the New Testament, we're commanded to honor our parents, love our spouse, provide for our children. So we don't use a passage, passages like this to justify being a lousy husband or dad or whatever, but our love for Jesus, as you see in Matthew chapter 10, should make love for our closest family members look like hate in comparison. We go wherever he says to go, knowing that because self is no longer our God, safety is no longer our priority. As followers of Jesus, we resist sin. We risk our lives in obedience to him. So I ask you, are these things true in your life? In my life, I mean really true, to follow Jesus is to leave behind 
Maybe a better way to put it is to lay down all things in order that we might live for one thing, to glorify the King. Why? Because of who he is. So follow this. Don't miss this. Please don't miss this. All this sound, may sound extreme until we realize who we're following and we realize that he is worthy of every bit of our lives and so much more. This is Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. A man who finds a treasure hidden in a field that he knows is worth more than everything else he owns put together. So he covers it back up and he goes and sells everything he has, all that he has. People are saying to him, you're crazy. Why are you selling everything you have? He says, I'm gonna buy that field over there. They say, you're crazy. Why are you gonna buy that field? And he smiles and he says, I have a hunch. He smiles because inside he knows that he has found something worth losing everything for. And brothers and sisters, in Jesus, we have found someone worth losing everything for. Jesus is that good. He's that great. He's that glorious. And being a Christian means gladly, like with joy, abandoning everything for his glory. To be a Christian is to live with joyful dependence on the grace of Jesus, the one who takes the initiative to choose us. He's pursued us. Like, why have you and I been reached with the gospel? Why was I born into a part of the world where I've heard the gospel Pretty much since the day I was born. Can I just say the obvious? Like, I had nothing to do with where I was born. It was the pure grace of God. And why was I not born in a remote mountain where I've never heard his name? And the only answer I have is the grace of Almighty God. And it's the only answer you have, too. Not one of us has the gospel in our hearts by our own merit. We have the gospel by his mercy. Jesus said it. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should abide. So whatever you ask in my name, he may give it to you. He takes the initiative by his grace to pursue you and me, to pursue us. He provides the power to use us. God promises to give you and me everything we need to bear much fruit for him in this world so that he gets the glory through, the, through us. Don't miss how good this is. To see what Jesus does with these initial disciples. Like who would have thought? Peter? The disciple with like the foot-shaped mouth would one day preach the first Christian sermon and lead 3,000 people to Jesus in a day. John would write books and letters containing the New Testament that would still be used to lead people to Jesus 2,000 years later. James, Andrew, others, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew would scatter to the nations proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. These guys would literally alter the course of human history forever. And they did not look like a world-changing task force, but that's the beauty of God's design, to take weak, humble, lowly, meek sinners like Peter and Andrew and James and John and you and me and to enable us to do far more than we or anyone else could ever imagine to the praise of his glory. God, may it be so in me, may it be so in you, may it be so in us. To be a Christian is to depend on the grace of Jesus. To be a Christian is to live with faithful adherence to the person of Jesus, when so many in the crowd are looking to dilute what it means to follow Jesus, to realize we're not casual listeners here. We're not convinced listeners. Even the demons believe in Jesus. No, we're committed to lifelong learners and followers. Jesus is our life. To be a Christian is to live with total trust in the authority of Jesus, saying my life and every part of it belongs to you. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's the master of every domain in our lives. He's the Lord of every detail in our lives. And ultimately, to be a Christian is to live with urgent obedience to the mission of Jesus. Again and again, we see it. Every follower of Jesus, a fisher of men. Every disciple, a disciple maker. This is for all of us, for the spread of God's glory in all the nations. This is an unconventional plan that requires a universal response. There are no spectators in the mission of God. Not one of us intended to be on the sidelines. Every one of us engaged in this task, all of us knowing that the cost of following Jesus and obeying this commission is great. He's made that clear to all of us, but don't miss it. The cost of not following Jesus and disobeying this great commission is far greater. Like whenever Jesus calls disciples to a cost, he calls them to reward, to treasure that will last forever. So God, help us to live in this world for treasure that will last forever. We must replace casual Christianity with passionate love for Christ if we're gonna rectify the great imbalance and obey the Great Commission. All right, two more. Number eight, hang with me. Number eight, we must replace doctrinal weakness with biblical conviction. We must not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We must not be ashamed. We must know whom we have believed. We need deep conviction about the greatness of God. This is what prompted Isaiah to go, a glimpse of God in all of his glory. 
This is what John wrote to the church about when they were being persecuted in the first century for proclaiming the gospel. John told them about the glory of God in Revelation 4 and 5. I so wish we had time to read and study, meditate on these texts, so go back and do that. We must have deep conviction about the greatness of God. He sits at the center of the universe. He dwells in unapproachable light. He's surrounded by unending praise at every moment. Multitudes of angels and all of creation are shouting his praise. He's the just judge of every single person whom we will all stand before, which means he's the only hope of mercy for every single person. He is holy above all. There is no one like him. He is holy, holy, holy. He has power overall. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's infinitely timeless, and he is infinitely glorious beyond our ability to comprehend. He is supreme above all things. He's the sustainer of all things, and he is sovereign over all things, including you and me. Jesus is the conquering lion promised in Genesis 49 from the line of David, Isaiah 11. Jesus is the slaughtered lamb who takes away the sin of the world. His worth is undisputed. His work is unforgettable. His worship is universal. He enacts judgment, and he ensures salvation. Behold his glory, knowing that the glory of God beckons us to receive salvation and knowing that God holds the future glorification of believers in his hand and God holds the final damnation of unbelievers in his hand, which means we must cry out for the mercy of God or collapse under the judgment of God. The glory of God beckons us to receive salvation and the glory of God motivates us to accomplish this mission. Why go to all the nations? Because God is worthy because Jesus is sovereign, because he reigns as the risen and exalted king with all authority in all the nations. And we know one day every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So why do we go to Muslim nations? Because Muhammad is not worthy of their glory. Jesus alone is worthy of their glory. Why do we go to Hindu nations? Because the 300 million gods being worshiped in Hinduism are all false gods, and Jesus alone is worthy of their glory. Why do we go to Buddhist nations? Because Buddha doesn't deserve their glory. Jesus does. Why do we go to atheistic nations, animistic nations, to every nation, because there's a God, his name is Jesus, and he alone is worthy of all glory. And the people who believe God is that good will give their lives, making his goodness and his greatness and his glory known. We need deep conviction about the greatness of God. We need deep conviction about the necessity of the gospel. There's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. We need deep conviction about the necessity of God's provision in the gospel. Jesus alone is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through him. Salvation's found in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And not just the necessity of the gospel, we need deep conviction about the necessity of our proclamation of the gospel. That if we don't proclaim it like we've seen it tonight, tonight and if they don't hear it, that they can't be saved. Luke 24, part of the essence of the gospel is the proclamation of Jesus' name to all nations, to the ends of the earth, Acts chapter one. We've seen it, Romans 10. How can they call on him if they not believed in him? How can they believe if they not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And on top of all of this, we need deep conviction about the horror of hell. About what the Bible teaches about hell. What God tells us is a lake of fire, a place of ultimate justice. Jesus tells us it's a place of fiery agony. People say, isn't that just figurative language? It's not literal fire, is it? Isn't that symbolic language? Well, I don't know for sure, but even if we assume for a minute that fire is symbolic there, like what's it a symbol for, do you think? Nice winter retreat? Peaceful vacation getaway? No, it's a symbol for a terrifying place to be. Remember, the whole purpose of a symbol is to express in words something that can't be expressed in words. It should bring us no solace to think that maybe this is symbolic language. Jesus tells us hell is a place of fiery agony. Hell is a place of conscious torment and anguish, outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth, a place of continual rebellion, a place of vile association with the devil and his angels. It's a place of divine destruction God says, it's a place of complete separation from the goodness and glory of God. A.W. Pink writes, none but one who really knows God can begin to estimate what it will mean to be eternally banished from the Lord, forever separated from the fount of all goodness, never to enjoy the light of God's countenance, never to bask in the sunshine of his presence. This, this is the most awful of all. And it won't ever, ever end. Hell is a place of eternal duration. Everlasting contempt, Daniel 12 says. Eternal fire, Matthew 18. Eternal punishment, Matthew 25. 
Revelation 14, 19, and 20 all say that the smoke of this torment will go up forever and ever. Think about it, and ever. That adds nothing to the meaning of that phrase. Like forever would have been sufficient. But it's like God puts those two extra words in there so we don't miss the point. It won't ever, 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 ever end. Thomas Watson writes, thus it is in hell, they would die, but they cannot. The wicked shall be always dying, but never dead. The smoke of the furnace ascends forever and ever. Oh, who can endure thus to ever be upon the rack? The word ever breaks the heart. It doesn't break your heart. Does it break our hearts? Jonathan Edwards was preaching on this reality. He put it this way. He said, to help your conception, imagine yourself to be cast into a fiery oven, all of a glowing heat, or in the midst of a blowing, blowing brick kiln, or of a great furnace where your pain would be as much greater than that occasioned by accidentally touching a coal of fire as the heat is greater. Imagine also that your body were to lie there for a quarter of an hour full of fire, as full within and without as a bright coal of fire, all the while full of quick sense. What horror would you feel at the entrance of such a furnace? How long would that quarter of an hour seem to you? If it were to be measured by a glass, how long would the glass seem to be running? And after you'd endured it for one minute, how overbearing would it be to for you to think that you had yet to endure the other 14. But what would be the effect of your soul if you knew you must lie there enduring that torment to the full for 24 hours? How much greater would be the effect if you knew you must endure it for a whole year? And how vastly greater still if you knew you must endure it for a thousand years? Oh, then how would your heart sink if you thought, if you knew that you must bear it forever and ever, that there would be no end, that after millions of millions of ages, your torment would be no nearer to an end than ever it was, and that you would never, never should be delivered. But your torment in hell will be immeasurably greater than this illustration represents. How will then will the heart of a poor creature sink under it? How utterly inexpressible and inconceivable must the sinking of the soul be in such a case? God have mercy. on three billion people who are on a road that leads there. And nobody's even told him how to go to heaven. God, help us. God, wake us up. Give us deep conviction about the horror of hell and the necessity of the gospel and proclaiming it to all the nations so they might enjoy and exalt you in all your glory forever and ever. Number nine, what's it gonna to take to rectify this great imbalance? We must replace the idolatry of safety and prosperity in this world with hope and confidence in the world to come. In other words, we who no, we have an eternal, everlasting home in heaven with God. Need to stop living like this world is our home. And stop living like safety and prosperity in this world are the purpose of our lives. And you read 1 Peter 1, you see God's word to persecuted Christians in the first century, to Christians who were tempted to forsake their faith, to Christians who were tempted to shrink back from the mission, to Christians who were tempted to live for this world. And here's what the Bible tells them to do. The Bible says, look back, the God who called your name before the world even began, before this world was even created, God called your name. Look back at the people in history who have given their lives serving you, bringing the gospel to you for thousands of years before you were born. And then in your life on this earth, somebody loved you enough to bring the gospel to you. Look back at them. And look back primarily at the king who conquered sin and death for you at Jesus who spurned this world to die on a cross and rise from the grave and ascend into heaven and then look forward, look ahead, just like Ephesians 1 says to the inheritance that is guaranteed for you. You have a home waiting for you in heaven. Look forward to the glory that will be given to you in just a little bit of time from now, a vapor, a mist, and it'll be there. Revelation 3, you will sit with Jesus on his throne soon and look up at the angels who marvel at God's salvation of you. And then look at all the people from history who are cheering you on, who are reminding you, Hebrews chapter 12, to fix your eyes on Jesus. Do all that he's called you to do while you still have time. And ultimately, look up at the God who will guard and guide you all the way to the end. He promises to do that, Jude 24 and 25. So in light of all of that, 
Don't live for safety and prosperity in this world. You have a kingdom coming. And it's not just for you. It's for everybody you can bring with you. It's for people from every nation and tribe and tongue. Bring them with you, knowing it may be costly to do so. Actually, knowing it will be costly in this world to do so. Knowing that suffering will come in this world. But you now know that when God is your goal, suffering is actually a gift. Philippians 1 says it's granted to you suffering. When good things in this world are taken from you, what does that do? It drives you all the more to the God whose love and peace and joy will never, ever be taken taken away from you. Like, this is such a different way to look at this world and life in it, knowing that even when your life is gone, is gone it will not be the end. Because <laughs> when God is your goal, not only does suffering become a gift, but when God is your goal, then dying becomes gain. If we didn't know where we're going when we, when we die, or if we thought this world was all there is, then we would cling to safety and prosperity in this world. But we don't, because we know this world is not all there is, and we know that when we die, we will live. Yes, God has taken the worst thing that could happen to you and me, and he has made it the very best thing that could happen to you and me. God, help us to see the world as you see it. God, help us to see our lives as you see them, all the way to forever. So we're gonna take a break, after which we go into the last session we're going to talk about what all this means practically for each of our lives. But I want to remind you, like we've got so much in our lives to think about. But right now, one practical takeaway is happening at this moment. As you're watching and we're giving together, we are planting a training center right in the heart of the unreached, focused on rectifying this great imbalance and obeying this great commission. So even before we go into this last session, just thinking about so many things in our lives and practically what this looks like, I just want to remind you that like we have an opportunity right now to do something. And I, I want us to pray in light of that opportunity we have right now and in a bigger way in light of everything we've just walked through. So let's, let's turn our hearts toward God together right now before we go into this break. Father in heaven, thank you so much. We worship you, we thank you, we praise you. Thank you for your only son, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you so much for your um, love. Thank you so much for your blood on the cross. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that you died for us and you raised from the dead. You bring resurrections. You resurrected and bring resurrections in our life. You seated us in heavenly places. Lord, thank you so much that you are God of order. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit all work together to fulfill the great commissions through us, through people. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you so much. You call us friends, you call us children. We are your children through faith and through the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you so much for the leaders, for the people that have a heart to care for, uh, for the great unbalance in this world, in your mission. In your, in your name, Lord Jesus Christ, you called all of us, go, go to the end of the earth. Lord, I ask you to bring this balance uh, where people go to places that they never heard your name. They never know you. They never feel your love. And they, they never heard your name, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the great uh, commissions, Lord. You call us. For that reason, we are here together to worship you, to praise you, to um, hear from you, Lord Jesus Christ, to equip hearts and minds that we we go and and reach to uh, to and reach people group in the world. Lord, I remember when I was in Afghanistan, I was looking for a Bible. I was looking for a Christians. I was looking desperately for years to find someone to know about you, Lord Jesus Christ. 
I find no one. I had to leave my country, the country I have born. Lord, I had to leave to, to find you, to know about you, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, you know the harvest um, plentiful. You send workers, Lord. Send support. Lord, thank you so much for um, bringing people together to care for um, for the nations, for and reach. We, we go through the order to to care for the great unbalance, the great commissions, and and reach people group in the world. Lord, thank you for the offering that this offering go to to the places to the program that that is 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 planted for for the training uh, training facility for the uh, for the uh, middle east people the the, the the so many people that they follow you but they still don't know how to how to um worship you properly Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, I know people who uh, lead the home churches, but they cannot explain uh, how you come in this old, how you um, bring salvations, your great plan. But because they know your love, you sh you come to their uh, to to their life and dreams and visions and save them from the sickness, and they start following you. Lord, we ask you for um, uh, a great discipleship movement among enriched people group all around the world, especially for Afghanistan, Lord. Oh, we worship you, we thank you, we ask all the blessings over this offering. I ask you to continue, uh, equip us, and give us the heart that um, uh, feel you uh, and 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 go after your calling, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you, and we worship you because you are worthy of worship, and you are the only to be worshipped on earth and heaven and under heaven. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.